when we are doing the will of our true self we are inevitably doing the will of the universe in magic these are seen as indistinguishable that every human soul is in fact one human soul it is the soul of the universe itself and as long as you are doing the will of the universe then it is impossible to do anything wrong Greetings. It is I, Keats Ross, host of the Pragmagic Podcast, a podcast about the confluence of art and metaphysics and the creative process. And what's a bigger creative process than a lifelong journey and pursuit and seeking of who we are? I'd like to introduce today's guest, Harv Bishop of HarvBishop.com. I think he, along with writers like Mitch Horowitz and Royce Christian, are single-handedly reforming new thought. And new thought was a metaphysical, practical magic movement uh, that really gained momentum, uh, I would say, uh, in the in the new age era. And it's finding its renaissance, but not without some growing pains. And I talked with Harv about where new thought's been, where it can go, how chaos magic can help support and uplift and evolve new thought. We also share an incredible uh, trajectory ourselves, both coming from very diverse religious backgrounds, very diverse spiritual backgrounds um, that all kind of conspire to this conversation and who we are today. And for this week's episode, I divined the episode art with The Disruption Generator. You can find more at thedisruptiongenerator.com and I'll show you the cards I pulled. The first, goat. Second, iguana. And the third and most important, misshapen. Now you'll notice I used misshapen image as the episode art for today because Harv Bishop is reforming new thought. It has kind of grown. It has been misshapen over time. It has come from organic absolutes like goats or iguanas, maybe, and has turned into something, a new thought form, a new egregore, a new servitor in and of itself. And it's time to reconfigure the DNA of new thought. So if you want to learn more about the Disruption Generator, grab a book at disruptiongenerator.com. It's written by Eric J. Millar and put out through our art collective, we the hallowed.org. Without further ado, here is my conversation with New Thought Reformer, Harv Bishop. We are here with Harv Bishop. It's good to see you, Harv. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, I consider you a figurehead in what I would call the reformation of new thought. And I'd love to just, you know, figure out where new thought is going, where it's been, what can be better with it. And I thought we'd start with your background and what brought you into this practical mysticism almost. Well, a couple of threads there, Keats. Um, I, I grew up in a family that um, explored uh, spirituality very widely uh, my parents were nominal Catholics, but they were what I would call social Catholics as opposed to cradle Catholics. Uh, my dad had had a number of um, psychic experiences uh, throughout his life, my mom as well. So um, they, they definitely knew well that, you know, there was something, you know, beyond the ordinary, something beyond what would be in a traditional. My dad uh, studied all of the works of Edgar Cayce quite extensively. Uh, my mom read New Thought Pioneers like Joel Goldsmith and Ralph Waldo Trine, so I was steeped in that as I grew up. My grandmother heavily into the occult. Uh, she read uh, 
Jung's uh, Memories, Dreams, Reflections autobiography out loud to me when I was uh, around 12. And I was utterly captivated by it, which was kind of odd for a kid. But so just by it uh, throughout my life. And when I was about 18, um, I went to a Mile High Church of Religious Science um, in Denver after I got out of high school. Um, and uh, the Mass just wasn't, Catholic Mass wasn't doing it for me anymore. My favorite words were, you know, the Mass has ended, go in peace. And I was like, right, I'm out of here. Uh, <laughs> Mile High was very refreshing. It was open to all religions, and I understood that well from my family background, and um, I enjoyed it a lot. Are you familiar with Marilyn Ferguson at all? The yes. Aquarian Conspiracy? Yes. So I grew up for a time. My father was a part of that compound in L.A. Oh, wow. And actually, Prag Magic, the title, comes from a Marilyn Ferguson edited book from the Brain Mind Bulletin which was mm -hmm. a new thought zine. Right. So I thought you might get a kick out of that. There's some yeah, heathers, you know. Yeah, no, that's very cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. I will remember that book. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it, was, it, it did a lot for me as a kid being around it. So we share similar backgrounds and that it was kind of always there. It was always in the peripheral. And I was wondering, you had mentioned in a, in a biography piece that uh, like a – was it a Hasidic Jew had taught you a lot of like Jewish mysticism and that's yeah. when it started? Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was, I'd, I'd been in New Thought for uh, probably about 20 years by that point when I discovered the rabbi. Again, there was a, a Carl Jung connection because he was a guest speaker at the Denver's Jung Society. Wow. And uh, I was so pumped. Um, a little bit of background here, too. My dad died when he was fairly young, mid-60s. In the last two years of his life, he did a deep, deep dive into the Kabbalah. And reading a lot of rabbis in Jewish mysticism, and he would do these extemporaneous homilies, at, you know, family dinners and, and get-togethers and things, and he'd be always a little bit embarrassed. And I think, well, that's interesting. It's cool. But, hey, I'm new thought. I know everything. Um, <laughs> And then when he passed, I thought, what was it that drove him? What, what grabbed him so much that this, you know, really consumed the last two years of his life? And so when, the, when I heard the rabbi was coming to the Yun Society, I was like, yeah, I'm there. And um, I was so really excited, and I drug a friend down there. It turned out we were a week early, uh, and there was zero, no one there. So we came back the next week. I heard him, and... Um, that started a 25 year um, and still going uh, opportunity to go to his classes and as a Gentile, as an ex-Catholic, yeah. uh, his, his openness to, you know, having me there and including me. I mean, wow. I mean, w what an incredible gift. And I think the one thing he said that night that grabbed me more than anything, and I've tried to live my life by it, he said that truth can be viewed two ways. You can see it as an open circle or you can see it as a, a pinpoint. If you see it as an open circle, then there's room to disagree, there's room to share perspectives. Everybody's perspective is important, and it, it takes a communal effort to explore these deep mysteries and, and how to live in the world in order to, uh, to really come to a closer approximation. And that's, in, in his view, that's something, and in Judaism, mystical Judaism, that's something that always evolves. It doesn't get stuck. Right. Uh, so in his approach, there is no real fundamentalism. Um, then there's, the, you know, the, the point, the tiny point. And it's the truth. I've got it. Anybody else comes up here and claims to have the truth. I'm pushing them off this tiny point. Mm -hmm. So uh, the open circle is just an absolutely great model. I try to, uh, you know, and I resonated to it from because my, and in fact, my um, spiritual background and in my family was this kind of open circle with multiple perspectives. You know, when you know, my dad's going to Mass one day and reading the Tibetan Book of the Dead the other, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, you just naturally uh, resonate with that. So the rabbi's classes uh, uh, have been a, a really great gift. Yeah, it's funny. I, sh I share that as well. I grew up for the first half of my childhood pretty Catholic. And the second half, uh, Jewish. And oh. one thing that I remember that resonated with me much more with uh, 
the kind of the dichotomy between Catholicism and Judaism is how they uh, treat uh, like excommunication or, you know, there's excommunication in the Catholic church, which is they just take your right away from talking to God somehow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They take that away. But in Judaism, the worst that can happen to you is they kick you out of the community. And to me, that's always resonated more within this kind of shared, you know, paradigm with people and belief, how, how much deeper that is to me that uh, they say, you know, like what's between you and your God or between you and God is between you and God. You know, it's very, it's almost pragmatic in that sense too. So that's always stayed with me. Yeah. And then, I mean, on the pragmatic piece, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that really, you know, as people often ask, you know, why have you studied this for so long? And I, I can't really come up with an answer. I mean, I think there's a past life connection. I think a lot of different things, but it, it's the only way I can describe it is like I was suddenly being given fresh oxygen to breathe. Yeah. Uh, and it, it was just so, so amazing that way. And to the pragmatic piece, I mean, it's the most earthy mysticism I've been exposed to. Yeah. Because everything is, Yes, you touch the transcendent, but you don't trust touch the transcendent to zone out. It's like it's touching it to how you live, and and that you know the rabbi um, Howard Hoffman uh, always talk, and he has he has a cool website if anyone wants to check it out. But uh, he he always says this, it's like every human being is born with two coins in their pocket. One says, "I am but dust and ashes." And the other side says the world was made just for me, and you've got to grasp that um, that paradox the, the between those two coins and, and contradiction came, almost. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I came to realize that that uh, that that new thought was very very good. On the world was made just for me. Right. But they don't grasp the I am but dust, dust and ashes piece. That's what I. I mean, that's kind of the the apex of what I want to get into with you today is kind of that uh, the institutionalized new thought versus, you know, what new thought can be and how it will grow and become something new. Do we call it something different? Do we evolve it? Like, where do we go with it from now? But I think first, let me circle back and excuse me for the meandering questions. But um, what brought you into like a new thought service? Like how, what did that look like? It was, you know, at, at that time, uh, it was the 1970s, I'd just gotten out of high school, um, it looked a lot like a traditional church service. And yeah. that, that I found out that was by design. I mean, they wanted it, to, you know, they sang the Our Father, they had songs, they, you know, a sermon. And they were wanting to give people a bridge so that when they came out of more traditional religions, they'd feel comfortable. Um, and there, there, was, there was basically two messages at the core of new thought. The, the one I like the most is that there's truth in all religions and we can learn from all religions. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the, you know, the, the mind power, uh, the mind metaphysics um, that, that you create and shape your own reality. And that's where I think things get a little problematic. And, and as we can talk about in a bit, uh, where I think chaos magic is a really good corrective because there it's like you can nudge the odds a certain direction, but you don't create everything that happens in your life. And right. I also think that's a, a big fault of where uh, chaos magic is heading to. I think it's turned into very much a self, uh, you know, um, what do you call it? It's a selfish, you know, kind of, trajectory for a lot of practitioners and that there's not a lot of reverence given to the pieces they take. Yeah. yeah, Um, I can can see that. And so with that, what are some of the things in new thought that made you uh, kind of taken aback or want to point out, you know, where it should go, where to evolve it? Oh gosh. I I mean, (laughs) there's, I mean, a lot of things I've, I began to question probably even 20 years ago, and as I got more deeply into study with the Rabbi Hoffman, um, I began to realize that, you know, as the Rabbi always says, it's like you don't want to treat God as a cosmic Pez dispenser, you know. Right. That that there's more to our experience in this world than trying to um, 
just get everything we want. Um, and there's a, you know, a, in a certain superficiality, you know, like, you know, you, in New Thought, you're looking for the parking genie. And there's nothing wrong with looking for the parking genie, but, you know, yeah. there's more to it. Now, I, I, I want to be fair here because there are within New Thought and even within my old Thai church, my home church, I mean, there are s some ministers and practitioners, different people that are extraordinarily deep. I mean, right. it's, Reverend Dr. Patty Lucas is one good example. That, and she's, she's gone deeply into Native American spirituality. She does sun dances, uh, vision quests, uh, and not just weekend workshop stuff. I mean, she's working with, a, with actual Native peoples on that. So... Um, I was going to ask how the like what the appropriation kind of influx is, is like and what are the you know the rough edges of bringing in those certain things too because I know that's uh, a big thing these days. Yeah, and and Dr. Patty's history on that's like goes back over twenty years. I mean, yeah, and yeah. she's not just gone to workshop uh, with uh, people who have appropriated that kind of thing. Right, she's right. Doing the real deal. What you mentioned though, I mean, is a. Uh, uh, is a problem and and with the sort of shop and um it's it's a big problem in chaos magic too i would i would think. i would think yeah yeah, yeah i would think uh, yeah then and i've noticed that selfish trajectory that you've talked about that's definitely an issue that i, I think i picked up with uh, you know mm -hmm. the uh my initial foray into, into it but still i think people like gordon white um, um pete carroll is a bit dogmatic but interesting yeah uh, I've I've seen some really interesting people there, but yeah. So I mean, I think I think there there's genuine, sincere um, people that are open to pursuing those paths, uh, but then there's also dogmatic fundamentalists like there are in any human organization. Right, and yeah, I didn't mean to you know say that all new thought is institutionalized or in, even institutionalization is bad. You know, right. in a certain way. But I know that uh, recently you have posted harvbishop.com. You've had these amazing articles. I call them incendiary because they're very much telling of uh, like almost a systemic problem in any kind of organized religion, you know, or any, any institutionalized thing where there's not a way to deal with transgressions with, you know, the, the ministers almost. Right. Yeah. And, and, <clears throat> that I mean, if if New Thought has a huge Achilles heel, it's in victim blame, yeah. and and you know, and that's where I think the, the chaos magic can uh, open up. Uh, you know, if, if people feel like they're nudging odds in their direction as opposed to every little thought literally becomes true. Right. So, you know what? Well, my wife and I, even to the point where we we experimented with chaos magic, was uh, she had uh, surgery emergency surgery a couple of years ago nearly died and then it took three or four surgeries to correct that uh, and you know when you're in a tradition that says well why'd that happen well it was in your consciousness you you know terrible thing happens you're out picturing your your consciousness and then immediately people feel guilty what what is in my consciousness is you know caused this to happen to me right and i mean that's a very simplistic uh, view of things and and certainly again not all new thought ministers would embrace that but a good chunk of them do and it's very easy then to to blame others for their suffering um, even now like you'll you'll hear a minister you know say you know they there's this idea that new thought needs to work for social justice and I think that's a good thing and that's kind of on the progressive just but so, they, you know, they have the slogan, it's time to create a world that works for everyone. And then, you know, you'll get some died noble fundamentalist that says, well, we already have a world that works for everyone. Well, you know, you're going to, I mean, honestly, you go over to Asia and tell some child that's been sold into child sex slavery that they already have a world that works for them, that somehow that child thought their way into these horrific circumstances. Yeah. And it's just bullshit. So, um and, and I think a lot of people eventually come to that point. So with my wife's job layoff, with the health, uh, all that stuff, it's like we were cut adrift uh, with um, traumatic circumstances. And at the same time, we're really questioning these new thought teachings. And it's like when you're cut adrift and you don't have sort of what's been your rock, 
for 20, 30 years. Um, you know, you, it, it took us all to get back on our feet. And yeah. it took us a while to, uh, uh, to and, we, and the idea of even doing a new thought practice was just not there for us. So, you know, we, we experimented with sigils, we experimented with a lot of different things. I think that's, I mean, that's where all change comes from, right? Is adversity mm-hmm. in a way. But it makes me think of, you know, there's in Mitch's book and the Miracle Club, he brought up, I mean, that was one of the major points that mm-hmm. really resonated with me. But also another thing was this idea of recidivism and this idea of just, you know, uh, being accountable for setbacks, for personal setbacks, not, you know, uh, maybe it, this is to put it pretty layman like but don't be so hard on yourself <laughs> you know? exactly exactly and and then you know if you if you're not if you're not wasting time um trying to trace obsessively every single thought that might have led you to some misfortune or the other uh and if you give up trying to control everything then you can relax you can you can say okay what worked what didn't uh you know mitch is huge on experimentation uh, and then in my life, it's like, oh, no, give me concrete answers. Tell me what to do. You know, <laughs> I, I want, before I do anything, I want the map laid out. Right. This last two years, uh, you know, with my wife, we, we crossed the country in a van uh, at an age when you normally, you know, don't do van camping. Mm-hmm. Spent a year in Europe. Uh, we did some amazing things. And it was largely because of our willingness to let go of needing to have every single answer and just to experiment. So, so what is that? Is there, is there some kind of reverence to chaos that needs to be adhered to in a bit in New Thought or beyond? Is there some like, you know, I, idea that you're only responsible to a point and to, you know, when the, let the chips fall where they may? That's, that's really, I, Mitch, I think, in my, to my mind, was the first to articulate that in the New Thought context. Yeah. And when I read his book, One Simple Idea, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. That's a new thought I can relate to. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So you know, to, to just briefly sort of touch on the articles, because a lot of it deals with sort of inner church workings. I don't want to right. yeah. Yeah. that. But in New Thought, um, they, they train for four years what are called practitioners, and they're based on uh, Christian science practitioners. And their idea is they hold the truth of, of your divinity. They hold the truth that whatever it is, is co- your good is co- you're basically your good is coming to you. And so they're trained, but they're also anything that gets the most, I <clears> guess, <throat> drummed into them is that your um, reality and what happens to you and your circumstances begin and end in your consciousness. Um, so you, they, you have these practitioners who trained for four years, who spent approximately $10,000 getting certified and licensed. Uh, and and uh, these three people, and there's many more uh, that have come forward, uh, essentially they, they didn't have the money to tithe to the church uh, for a while. Um, you know, they had illness, other difficult life circumstances. So this church a minister called them in, and, and they all think, well, it's, you know, they're reaching out. They want to help. Well, no, you've got three choices. You can give more money. You can attend a prosperity re-education camp, which is a horrendous insult to these people that have spent four years of their life studying. They know the message as well as anyone. Or third, you can, you can, you can essentially unlicense as a practitioner, and you're done as a practitioner. Uh, and these three people were traumatized. I mean, this this their dream. They wanted to help people. And suddenly, you know, they're being told, they all gave tremendous service to these churches, uh, showing up on Sundays, praying for people, helping out in other ways. Like, that's that didn't even matter. I mean, that wasn't even on the radar. Um, so that's when I, you know, I heard the, the three of these stories and Initially, I was a little reluctant to, you know, because I was pissed, and I wanted to run it. And I thought, oh, God, this, you know, that everybody's so happy, positive, and new thought, and are they even going to listen, and so on. Uh, but eventually, um, just in the last couple of weeks, I put it out there, and the outpouring of people who've been similarly victimized, and in the first article, I'd call it abuse, but I would call it absolutely religious abuse now, yeah. because these people were traumatized. And the response has been really overwhelming. Uh, 
And there's some early indications that some people in leadership roles are taking it seriously. My fingers are crossed. I hope this can create some real change. But That's amazing. I, I had no idea that New Thought had the faculties of such. I still thought it was just kind of just this, you know, uh, just this kind of literature-based, you know, I- ideology in a way, which is funny. Growing up how I did, uh, I just ne- didn't know about such an infrastructure, you know. Yeah, that actually, that came on board. Um, I think Unity was among the first. Uh, Divine right. Science, uh, Religious came a little bit later. Actually, Religious Science didn't become a full-blown denomination until, you know, I think, late 50s, early 60s. Right. So, <clears throat> maybe you can speak on a little bit of what these transgressions are or what these uh, practitioners are being held accountable for in that sort of way. Essentially, uh, as one of them was told, uh, you know, this person lost their uh, job. They were laid off during the re- economic recession of 2008. Right. Called in, where's your giving? And, and so the, the person quite legitimately said, look, there's a recession. You know, laid off. I'm doing the best I can. We're talking women post-50, uh, very hard demographic to get a new job. Uh, and they were told, well, if you think the economy is the cause of your problem, uh, you're, not, uh, you're not taking responsibility for your consciousness. It's not the economy. No outside circumstances, it's just your consciousness. And, you know, to, to tell that to somebody who's you know, chronically ill or in very difficult life circumstances is just flat out abusive. I mean, it's blaming them for their misfortune. Yeah, I agree. Do you see a disturbing trend in that sort of behavior? Uh, it's, it's, it's still around. It's been around for years. I, yeah. I've, heard, I've heard from one minister who said that it's been a unity minister, not religious science. He said it's, it's been in every church uh, that he's ever belonged to. Uh, there was an absolutely amazing uh, minister who lived and, he, and breathed the teachings at Mile High Church. And he, he ended up uh, with, um, oh, what's that? Um, that, those stomach bugs, uh, I can't think of the name of it right off, but uh, E. coli, uh, nearly died. Uh, he amazed, absolutely amazed the nurses and hospital staff, as sick as he was, he lifted their spirits. I mean, that's how powerful this guy was. He gets back to church, and they have a little reception line at the end and shaking hands, and this uh, congregant comes up, up to him and says, what were you thinking to get that? What were you thinking to get sick? And it's like, oh my God, how superficial, how idiotic. I mean, dark. Yeah. Yeah. This man, uh, you know, he had horrendous circumstances. He came through it and he inspired the medical staff. What more do you want of a human being? I mean, yeah. really. Uh, so, and, you know, I, I remember a piece of art I saw uh, based on fortune when I was in you know, Italy last year. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, was, will fortune smile on me or will fortune not? Uh, will I have good luck? Will I have bad luck? And it, that was the whole theme of the painting. And I thought, oh, my God, that's fundamental what religious science tries to answer and new thought tries to answer. It tries yeah. to say, if you get right with your consciousness, you're always going to have good luck. You're going to bat a thousand, you know. Yeah. You're going to have a great life. And, and yeah. It just, it's not part of the human experience. It's absolutely not part of the human experience. And I think that, to contrast that with like Rabbi Hoffman's teachings and, and the, the Jewish mysticism is, again, that's the world was made just for me. They've got that coin nailed. But what they don't have is the I am but dust and ashes. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, you can, and, you know, New Thought teaches that you're a part of the divine. Mm-hmm. Jewish mysticism teaches you're a part of the divine. But, you're also a fuck up, and so is everybody else, and yeah. that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking uh, earlier today about, you know, I think it was Jung that said, you know, the measure of a man is how he reacts, right? Mm-hmm. How, mm-hmm. how elastic is he about shit happening to him? Because we're just we're thrown into a world of chaos, and so that absolutely. You know, and so that's the positive mind metaphysics I totally get because that should be a source code for 
how you're to navigate shit being thrown at you left and right. Right. You don't, you don't, uh, you don't control the events themselves, but you, you right. have some control over how you respond. Exactly. Yeah. And, then, and there, there again, uh, the, uh, I think the, the chaos uh, is such an important corrective because, uh, uh, you, you know, again, you don't have the conceit that you can control everything. Right. And I was going to just ask that what, facets of chaos magic really perked your ears up about working in conjunction with or helping new thought? Well, at, uh, the first book I read was Gordon White's Chaos Chronicles. Yeah, Chaos and, Protocols? Or, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Chaos Protocols. And um, yeah, that it, it just page after page just blew me away. Yeah. Because, I mean, he was saying you, you can shape the odds. And he even came up with a interesting and plausible explanation for, you know, does prayer work or does um, magic work or working work? And, and he said, yeah, essentially they all work. It, it changes the odds. So he said, you know, and in his inimitable ways, like say, like you're going to a bar on Friday and you do a working to get laid and you come home and you haven't gotten lucky. Uh, but he says, what happens, you know? said, so how, can, how can I say that every one of these things works, but it didn't happen? He says, well, maybe your odds went from 1 in 300 to 1 in 50. Right. So, um, and, you know, it's, it's a, like a somewhat crude example, but it could be applied to a lot of different things. I mean, it makes sense. It almost seems uh, repackaged isn't the right word, but it seems like these archetypal thoughts that are permeate within both, you know, that are working in different like praxis you know like one one is uh maybe too full responsibility but the other one is maybe too uh like result based if that makes sense yeah yeah i think so it, it's up you know the thing is uh, uh the new thought is re are, are you saying new thought is results based or uh or the chaos magic no chaos magic but okay I think yeah, they're, but both they're kind of i think both because, you yeah. know, like these practitioners that were drummed out, I mean, essentially they were being accused of not getting the results that they should have. Right. Um, so. I mean, yeah, that's deep and dark. I, you know, like with the chaos magic, my big grump as of late, I've, I've let go because, you know, I'm a practitioner, but I'm still learning and mm -hmm. I'm, going, I'm going through different stages of what it means to me and the identity of such things. And chaos magic to me has kind of turned into more of a dogmatic idea than how I utilize it or how I think it should be, but that doesn't matter at the end of the day. <laughs> you <know>? Right. <laughs> like right. that's, 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 that it doesn't matter. It is kind of whatever works or whatever works for you. But um, that, that's what I mean. That's what the, the thing is, is maybe one is too dogmatic already and the other one's getting kind there. Of working there. Yeah. yeah. That could well be, that could well be. Yeah. So what are your, thoughts on like are you do you have any thoughts on in implementing any chaos magic kind of protocols or are there i guess that would be a good question is it dogmatic do you know of certain you know practices that you would kind of put into new thought in a way i i think sigils for one thing yeah. i mean i i had some um again just before we went to europe my wife had a a recurrence of uh, really bad asthma, um, and it wasn't good for her. It wasn't good for uh, um, you know the potential for the trip. Uh, and I was reading uh, Chaos Protocols, and I thought, okay, let's let's put this to the test. So I created a couple of sigils, uh, and I, I tried to keep them, you know, that um, uh, you know, because Gordon White also talks about you know doing things that increase the odds at each stage. So it's not like you're going for the whole enchilada. Mm -hmm. So I started out just that, you know, she received the help that she needed and created a sigil around that as opposed to the new thought approach, which would be she was expressing perfect health and, and so on. Right. And so I, I did that on a Wednesday, and then the Thursday, Friday, it was getting worse. Uh, but uh, she connected with a home care nurse that she had known. Now home care nurses get over here right away. Uh, Gave her a lot of valuable advice uh, and uh, got her set up and so that she was already improving by the time we got to the doctor on Monday. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, and, 
And it was, um, I totally credit the, the sigils with that because it, how that unfolded, totally unplanned. Just heard from her out of the blue. She's like, you get over here right away. I can help. Um, it was absolutely awesome. And I think that goes, uh, that goes to uh, another thing. I mean, if we're talking about how these things work, I think another um, common through thought is that they say the law of attraction. Right. You know, it's a law. You're a magnet, and it's being drawn to you. But if I look at the work of David Spangler, uh, who lives up in Washington, he's done some amazing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and you know, kind of looking at that, too, with, with uh, Gordon White and all, it's, it, and Mitch touched on this in one of his medium pieces, is, is these sort of what New Thought would call manifestations come through everyday normal channels. Mm-hmm. And Spangler says, you know, really what you're doing is it's less a, you're less a magnet, and it's not so much a law of attraction, but you're... Um, you're stimulating uh, channels for synchronicities to happen. Synchronicities are amazing. They don't always happen, but when they do, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So I think with what we call the law of attraction and new thought, we're really talking about this sort of enhancing the potential for synchronicities. We're not talking about some ironclad law that reproduces every single thought you have. Right. I think the sigils and the chaos are better suited um, to to work with kind of enhancing those synchronicities. So where does, what is the, uh, almost the ethereal come into play with you and your idea of what the, these systems kind of operate on? Is there a limit to, or a, a kind of two woo, as I like to call it, <laughs> like mm-hmm. basis of, you know, things that are, that you're dealing with or your, you know, deities and, and, I'm not saying that's too woo, but is it right. like, is it just this pragmatic avenue where you're really just, because you're focusing, you're using ritualistic work and it's focusing your mind, it's focusing your ideas, you're obviously going to have it in the forefront of your thoughts, you're obviously going to think about it more, you're obviously going to do it. Like, if that is too pragmatic, what to you is the biggest or the most woo it can go? Well, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I, I think it's 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 probably both. And and you know, I yeah, what I would have said ten years ago, and what I say now, because I, you know, in a way, I feel like I know far less now than I did ten years ago. Yep, that, that's it's, that's, it's, that's the great work, right? It's just it's just a huge mystery. So I think one of the you know one of the disappointments I had with Pete Carroll. Um, was one he's like yeah well we do survive death for a while and then the energy just kind of dissipates and goes back into whatever uh and he said he was basing that on his personal experience that uh he had uh, you know he had encountered entities after they had passed of people he knew but that was right. for a short time um and and so that may be true for his experience but you know i had a couple of transpersonal encounters with my father's spirit, you know, 10, 15, 20 years after his passing. So, and again, I don't know. I mean, I, oh, that's yeah, what I, you're saying he put a limit on to what the reverberation or the echo of a spirit. Yeah. yeah. Or even if it's an echo or if it's still an ongoing right. entity and, and to my take too certain. From what I, yeah. What I, he was just too, he, and yeah, he's like, this is what it is, you know, and he was, he was a little too dogmatic on that. I, I mean, I'm open. I mean, there could be other explanations from my experiences, but right. what I perceived it was, a, you know, a direct encounter of some type. And the other is that it seemed to me Carol was relying so much uh, on physics to explain everything. And so that it kind of ruled out the transcendent. So in a way it's kind of, like the worst of all worlds because yeah. you get what you normally assume would be evidence of, of some unifying transpersonal force, but then you get it taken away from you at the same time and saying it's all explainable by quantum physics. That's, that's been my, my trouble with it, with those works and, and that, and like Phil, not Phil Hine to, to that much of a degree, but definitely with Pete Carroll, which is that it's the extremes of either or, you know, explain both. Kind of in a in a way that just I don't it seems too certain to me it seems it, too, exactly and yeah, you know rigid. I think I think I I, um, I prefer the openness of Dean Radin and, and Mitch and yeah. some other people 
And <laughs> again, I've had some experiences that I think to the best of, to the to the to the best interpretation that I have of those experiences, it suggests that there's there's certainly more than just uh, just the enhanced synchronicities. I think that's a part of the picture, uh, but I think there is a, uh, there are mystical realms, uh, you know, beyond that. So you have had personal kind of trans-dimensional wayfaring, as I like to call it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. At, at different times, and and there's people that are far more consistent with those experiences than I have uh, than I've had. But I mean, I've had my share of, of both that and, and the more garden variety psychic kinds of things, but nothing equivalent to my dad. Certainly. What do you think the because this brings me to the point of what practical mysticism is. Or I was I was listening to these lectures by uh, William Meter, I think, from uh, the Theosophical Society. Not familiar. Yeah, it, it's been it was pretty great. He does a thing on esoteric astrology, and it, you know, just fun to listen to. But his mm -hmm. thing is about the importance of this, you know, getting back into the practical mysticism, and I think I see that to a degree, but I also see it taken into this almost consumer you know, aspect of it. It's, I'm finding a lot of spirituality used or occultism, quote unquote, used as trends and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, more of an aesthetic. And I wanted to know, like, how, how do you see the, the future of this fight of like this great work? Like, how do we elevate this beyond just the commercial? Yeah. Boy, you know, so that's a really good question. It's an interesting question. I mean, it is, and yeah, we, I mean, we're seeing like now, like you can get witchcraft kits. At, yeah. At, um, yeah, everything's a hashtag. Herb, witch. Urban safari or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, th I think that's that's been a constant battle because I, you know, I think back to the eighties. And so much new age stuff was commercialized, right? And the crystals and the book that I and I don't know. It, it's a, I think you know, it's a, it's a starting point. It's not necessarily a terrible thing, but there, there comes a point. You know, it's I always say like if if spiritual growth was all love and light, a lot more people would be doing it. But it's like you, you know, you've you've got unhealed childhood wounds past life stuff um, probably at least from my perspective um, you know all kinds of things to deal with and and just just even with your personality I mean there, there was a there's a great um, the great story about four rabbis in the Talmud uh, who went into high mystical consciousness and sort of the 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 first guy he got up there and it's like oh man this is just like so totally cool I don't want to go back. There's no, no pain up here. I'm staying. And so he, you know, he, um, he died on the spot. And then um, another of the guys is, is like, you know, he's, he's up there and he's like, oh, my God, I'm just a total shit bag. I can see my entire thing here. And it, it, it's just all so dark. And so he came back and he started, you know, doing every wrong thing, every dark thing, because, you know, he thought, so I've worked so hard, and I thought I was perfect, and I'm not. And then it, only Rabbi Akiva uh, came out unscathed. And in Rabbi Hoffman's interpretation, it's like we're all a mixed bag, you know. We're good, we're bad, this, right. that, the other. Uh, and it takes it takes that higher awareness, it takes that taste of the transcendent to be able to look back without judgment, and then to uh, to to have that uh, that that gap um, that you know the the Hindus sometimes talk about that gap that you can slide into the consciousness where you can make choices and not be driven by you know uh, your impulses or or looking at your impulses being frightened having to be perfect having to be good you know you instead sure. you, can, you can make more intelligent choices and and. I mean, that's the piece, I think, the commercial spirituality piece. Uh, the commercialization of it can never tap. 
uh, yeah. you, uh, you can you can play with uh, you can play with the edges and the fun stuff and wave a wand around or whatever <laughs> float your boat but uh, if you're really going to go deep if you're really going to do what you're terming the great work I mean you you've got to you've got to grow some cojones and be able to uh, you know look at the full range of who you are the good and the bad and 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 work and, and make the best choices you can so this is a two-part question then from that mm -hmm. where, where does one start where does one start diving in and uh, not just you know uh meditation or um you know uh was another common you know kind of answer to this is like meditation or you know reading <laughs> or like mm -hmm. reading but a pragmatic way for one to jump in and then how does that relate to what is the initial start for or the initial tenet of new thought? And do you see a, a divide in that or, or do you share that same entry point still? Okay, so the theory behind new thought would be that you come in, you find out you have some control over your life, you get the parking place, you get the unexpected money, and then you'll want to dive deeper. Right. And it's like baiting you in a way. Yeah. And uh, kind of bait and switch. And oh, surprise, now you're in deep spirituality. <laughs> and it's true for some people who into it. I, I won't say it isn't, but a lot of people stay stuck at the manifesting the parking place level. Um, so that doesn't always work. Um, in, in my own case, <clears throat> um, I mean, <clears throat> I was probably kind of stuck there. Uh, but in my um, early 20s, I had some past life flashbacks that were pretty traumatic, and it's not something I go into in any great detail. Sure, sure. Um, it can still trigger me to this point, but it was like sort of like getting my ball squeezed in a vice. And so, in my own case, that's what pushed me deeper, 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 deeper to, you know, for maybe for the next 20 years, I pretty much lived like a monk and, and, explore deeply yeah, because I had to yeah and and to be absolutely truthful absent that um, I might have stayed at the surface so I don't know that I can you know you've almost got to have you I could be wrong here but I mean to to and I'm not like bragging saying like I'm the you know super deepest guru ever uh, at all but it just seems to me you've got to have a pretty serious prompt yeah. Uh, to to really undertake the, like the serious heavy duty great work kind of stuff. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess my question is a bit about the the last one or right right before the last one too is like what is that practice that one would need to jump into to kind of go past the consumer aspect or the trend aspect, the one daily kind of thing that you know will show kind of a devotion to the craft or devotion to this this method i would you know and there's probably different versions of this but i would say what we're doing right now yeah. uh, and, and and not making it such a solitary thing you know and the, that's interesting the yeah. rabbi always talks about you know the solitary mystic mode yeah Versus a, a more communal mode. And yeah. it's, I think it's a communal mode. I mean, I've got a good friend of mine, my wife, uh, different people that I can go really deep with. Uh, and they'll challenge me, I'll challenge them. Um, because we all have perspectives. And that's the beauty of the Talmud or Torah classes. I mean, it's like everyone has unique gifts. Everyone has a unique perspective. It takes all those unique perspectives. And it's not about trying to build a false unity, but it's about... Um, in, in smushing uh, differences, but it's honoring differences. So, like you're putting together a, a puzzle piece. So, I don't know. For me, I think it, it, it's always been a you know, I've got one foot in Buddhism, one foot in Jewish mysticism, one foot in new thought. Now, yeah. I, you know, I've got a toe in chaos magic. Uh, <laughs> And and just to be and you can kind of approximate that I guess as an individual because you can you can look at these deep questions that you have and then say okay let's uh, you know let's see where Gordon White comes in let's see where Rabbi Akiva comes in you know let's see where Ernest Holmes or or Joel Goldsmith comes in on this question and then just allow all those ideas to just get in there and kind of play around 
And then the extension of that is to you know, maybe pursuing different paths or people you feel that you can be open with and, and just have those really deep conversations because I find over time, you know, they really, they really create openings. And, um, inevitably, and if you allow yourself to be challenged, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to just get the, uh, the, the wand kept from urban safari and, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. No, I love that. I mean, usually I, I always hear that it, it starts solitary, you know, like I, I haven't heard what I think was my motivating factor for all of this was, you know, to glean more, to listen more, to learn more from people. And to me, that's, you know, my own kind of work or processes with it, you know, or process mm -hmm. with it. Oh, yeah, I can absolutely see that. And, and I think another area, and it's one that my wife and I really got into when we were in Europe, but art, museums, yeah. and that, that widening of a perspective. And again, to go back to Jewish mysticism, there's this idea that a spouse is a helpmate against. And what are they, you know, why do you want to marry a helpmate against? But it's a helpmate against the narrow view. In other words, you, you, you want that gift of those wider perspectives. Right. And art in the arts, um, I mean, you catch a glimpse of your soul in responding to it. You catch a glimpse of the artist's soul, their perspective, how they see the, you know, the sort of eternal problems uh, that, uh, you know, humans have always struggled with. You know, why is there suffering? Why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, and uh, so, to, you know, to spend some time in museums, uh, going to challenging films, different things like that. I love that. I mean, especially this day and age, you know, it's, it's so good to hear to, you know, challenge your thought, challenge your, your stationary existence almost in a way, you know? Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's, that's been my biggest MO. What's in the future for you, Mr. Bishop? What do you, what do you have coming up? What's, what's going on in your world today? Well, uh, we, do, we, do, we just got back from Europe in January, and it's, it's you know we're we're trying to figure out where life's taking us next. Yeah, so you you relocated to Colorado or, or went back? We to were, Colorado? Yeah, we were we were in the San Luis Valley, a beautiful place called Crestone, and mm -hmm. they maybe it's it's kind of spiritual land. They've got um, Zen Buddhist centers, they've got several Tibetan Buddhist centers, a Catholic monastery. I mean, it's like this huge um, international uh, religious spiritual type place wow it's, it's uh, ufos you get that thrown in there and then uh, supposedly a huge energy vortex which i think my, uh, my father lives in parker oh okay that's yeah, kind of south Forest. of denver mm -hmm. yeah yeah area but you know he's the one that kind of i blame for bringing me into this mess <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it, yeah it, it, it can feel like that at times yeah so we were there, and it was awesome, but it was also it was a little bit isolating, and, and uh, you know, we had some other issues in family and stuff we had to attend to here, so we're back in Denver. And uh, so it's like, where do we travel next? What do we do? I don't know. So it's we're, the last few years, we've kind of felt our way uh, along. So like that movie with Indiana Jones, where the step only appears after he puts his foot out over the abyss. Yeah. So we're getting kind of used to living that way. God, that's a metaphor for the great work. I feel. Or, yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, we're getting the we're getting the, our blogs back up and running. Uh, they've kind of been on hiatus. Uh, I've got the uh, a, a, a blog of, or not a blog, but an anthology of the blog uh, with some writing by Mitch and some other really cool people. And like I mean, Royce. Yeah, Royce. Uh, yeah, yeah, his his writing on uh, the meme stuff was so good on your blog yeah, I, and, love, I love that yeah. article and so looking forward to his uh, second and third installments uh, yeah i'm excited for that yeah. i need to have him on as well so uh we'll have the anthology out on new directions and new thought kind of hopefully pointing the way of a lot of people that are uh, taking some new perspectives on it and uh, so that's going to be coming uh, my wife and i both have some other books in the works and uh from there that's awesome. And just real quick, how did the how did Harvbishop com kind of be the hub for a lot of this? Again, it was totally unplanned. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was. Uh, I was ranting about something. My wife ran in the park, and I was ranting about the you know these uh, you know how New Thought needed to kind of you know reboot itself. And uh, she was like, you know, you really should write a blog. 
And normally I just like, um, okay, I, you know, I move her fully. I might have thought about it for a year for some reason. And I just, to this date, I don't know why I went home, read how to start a blog and started it uh, three days later. And oh, yeah, um, it, is, it has been a sword. And then Mitch, uh, I had interviewed him for Science of Mind magazine, and there was a lot of outtakes, so many good things. And so I ran one of his articles on, you know, why why law of attraction was kind of outdated, and it generated such a huge response, a huge outpouring. That original vision for the blog went by the wayside, and uh, you know, people said, you know, my daughter was blamed for the, you know, was blamed for the death of her child, her baby, different stories like that. And I thought, oh my God, this is. Um, just over time, uh, instead of being what I had originally intended, sort of the kind of more deep conversations we've been having, and I want to get back to that a little bit, but it took on a life of its own. And Mitch had some outstanding contributions, many other people as well. Uh, and it's, it's really become a forum uh, for, uh, for an opportunity to, uh, to rethink new thought. Uh, as a, one guy said, and he says, it's, it's, you know, it's time for, uh, Time for new thought to allow thinking again. Yeah, new, new thought. Yeah, exactly. And last question, Diane's doing okay? You guys are good? Yeah, we're good. We're doing good. So uh, awesome. we're ready to rock and roll. Hell yeah. Well, thank you so much, Harv. I really appreciate your time. Enjoy talking to you, Keats. Yeah, yeah. Let us not have this be the last time. That'd be awesome. <laughs> really appreciate it.